Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, so before we dive into it, I just want to echo two sentiments that have been kind of expressed throughout the, the two days. So the first is um, my extreme gratitude, really, for everyone in this room and the tremendous work you've done, um, and specifically Dave, Ashley, Jerome, um, and uh, Kieran. Um, this presentation is really built on the shoulders of you being giants. Um, so I just want to take this um, time to, to acknowledge you all and the work you do. Um, secondly, the, the second sentiment is DPX sucks, um, and we'll get into that in a little more detail here. Um, so to explain, I'm going to kind of set up our context and sort of the history of this problem, and then I'm going to pass it off to Caroline, who's going to kind of talk about um, the work we've done to address it. So this is MoMA, bathed in uh, digital projection here. Um, MoMA was founded in 1929, for those who don't know. And in 1932, the founding director, Alfred Barr, um, quickly realized that um, the only great art form peculiar to the 20th century, um, or I'm sorry, film being the only uh, great art form peculiar to the 20th century, um, should be collected so the American public um, could appreciate and uh, understand good films. So to that end and to achieve that goal, he hired this tremendous woman in, in every presentation I try to use this image, um, Iris Berry, who was a British film critic um, and she came to MoMA in 1935 and founded what was then uh, the Film Circulating Library, which then became the Film Department. Iris was amazing. Uh, she came under the recommendation of David O. Selznick. Um, and she really um, went around to the major Hollywood studios, were not really collecting film at the time, uh, made them realize that um, film was important uh, to the 20th century and to our sort of cultural memory, um, and started gathering material and bringing them into MoMA's collection. Uh, most importantly, she brought um, uh, D.W. Griffith's biograph collection um, into the museum, and I'll get to sort of its importance in a bit here. So uh, the museum, uh, you know, since 1935 has been actively collecting films. Uh, we, in 1996, uh, you know, started to sort of grow outside of the footprint of Manhattan. Um, we also have a tremendous amount of nitrate material. So we built this facility right here um, in Hamlin, Pennsylvania, um, where we have dedicated vaults for uh, nitrate storage, um, and over 300 um, individual films are stored, 1.5 million film stills, um, and a tremendous amount of video material. Um, I should also mention, um, which is sort of out of the purview of this presentation, but um, the museum started uh, formally collecting video art um, in 1975 uh, under sort of the direction of Barbara London, um, a tremendous curator in her own right. Um, and so that is also housed at Hamlin. So really, uh, the way MoMA dealt with and um, uh, preserved the film collections, this is Katie Trainer, our head of uh, film collections here, is through film to film preservation. Um, I would say our, our kind of preservation pipeline really started in earnest in 1970 um, and continued in terms of photochemical um, optical preservation uh, until I would say like the mid 2000s. In uh, around 2005, we start to see DPX coming into or digital intermediaries coming into this preservation workflow. Um, MoMA is still committed as much as we can, budget allowing, um, to going back out to film. So these digital intermediates were introduced in terms of um, blow-ups where optical would not give um, uh, good resolution, um, cleaning, um, uh, uh, some restoration techniques, and, and things of that nature. However, we start to see this transition um, you know, due to um, a number of factors being you know, uh, film labs closing, um, cost uh, being prohibitive, um, and exhibition practices where the DPX workflow starts to become the DPX to DCP workflow. Um, you know, preservation activities um, still run apace within the film department, but really we're seeing a proliferation of DPX material that is then finished to DCP. Um, there's still the desire to go out to film, and in, in most cases we still do, but sometimes there's a full stop at the DCP. And then it just kind of continues in, from there where we're starting to see a drop off in the film out um, uh, preservation sort of workflow and really this kind of uh, ending at the, um, the DPX or digital intermediary, DCP, and then finalized, I have a ProRes QuickTime here, um, reference file in terms of what these um, uh, preservation workflows are entailing at the moment. So how do we store and sort of preserve this material? At the museum, uh, we have a digital repository called, it's a bit of a mouthful, the Digital Repository for Museum Collections, or DRMC. 
Um, and just to kind of situate that within the context of the museum's e ecosystem, um, we use TMS, which I'll explain about in a second, um, which then there should be an arrow going back and forth there. Um, but that sort of talks to the DRMC. There's physical art storage as well. Um, there's a digital asset management system where we push um, dips essentially for curatorial preview. Um, we also have uh, physical artwork folders and electronic artwork folders in terms of um, uh, documenting um, you know, preservation activities, um, the uh, artist-related um, uh, uh, material in terms of um, the creation of the artwork, things of that nature. And then the DRMC, sort of at its most fundamental level, um, involves Archivematica, um, where we you know, uh, package everything into SIPs uh, using Bagot. We use Bagot to establish the chain of custody on everything. Um, it goes through Archivematica. And then we work with Archivum, um, where we achieve our um, you know, three copies. Uh, we have two, tape two LTO6 tape robots, one at Manhattan uh, 53rd Street, one Queens, which is across the East River. And then uh, we store our third escrow copy off in Hamlin. Um, Hamlin is about two hours outside of uh, Manhattan. So to kind of illustrate this with a very quick case study, um, that kind of neatly ties together this history of the um, film department. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, the Burt Williams Lime Kiln Club Field Day, 1913 to 2000, or, I'm sorry, 1913, 2014. Um, it's a really interesting um, example where this, uh, I shouldn't say film, it's sort of uh, a series of rushes came into the collection through the Biograph acquisition and largely stayed in the collection unknown to anyone there. Um, prints were struck, uh, acetate prints were struck from the um, nitrate negatives in the 80s, but no one really understood what this was until um, the curator, Ron Magliosi, started to research it further, and it turns out that it was a um, essentially uncompleted film by the actor uh, Burt Williams, who is a Caribbean-American actor, and it's most notable because it's an entirely African-American cast. Um, an entirely, basically, an African-American uh, film that was never realized or released. So that's why I say it wasn't reconstructed um, nor finished. It was sort of assembled and sort of brought to light by Ron and um, our film conservator, Peter Williamson. The reason I use this as an illustration is all of this material was scanned um, to 2K DPX and then uh, finished to DCP in sort of various iterations. Um, so. You know, like I said, it's not a finished film, so there's various sort of constructions that they've pieced together um, with various durations. Um, at the museum, we use TMS, as I mentioned, or the museum system developed by gallery systems. Um, it's really geared towards objects, single objects. Um, that'll be a theme sort of running throughout uh, the rest of my presentation. And so this is how we currently catalog the material now. Um, we're kind of fitting a square peg into a round hole. Um, but we're kind of making it work the best we can for our system um, as it is. So when this material is delivered from labs, it was scanned by Deluxe and finished at various other vendors. Um, like I said, we use Bagot, so we use bright blockers um, in our workflow. We use Bagot, which you know takes a lot of time with DPX material, as I'm sure you're all um, familiar. And then we put it into our system. And so as I mentioned, we're still sort of on this object level. So our whole system is really um, engineered and, and designed for single files. So a quick time going in through the Archive Monica pipeline, getting turned into a AIP is great. You know, It really works for um, our workflow and it was sort of how the system was designed. DPX, on the other hand, um, kind of breaks that whole system. Um, so, you know, just an in initial testing of the pipeline, um, a 300 gigabyte uh, QuickTime file took about a couple hours to process through. Um, the same size DPX file took four days to process. Um, another deficiency um, in our workflow, like I said, is the cataloging is not great. Um, our ability to capture a lot of the process history um, isn't refined. We're using um, uh, description there and then attributes in the TMS that isn't really connected to the digital file. So we'd like to package um, a lot of this decision making and a lot of the characteristics of the DPX within the file itself and are struggling to do this. And then finally, there's a tremendous amount coming in. Um, we, uh, and these are rough estimates, but we're basically looking at about 500 to 600 terabytes in terms of DPX material alone. Um, and this is by far the um, 
the greatest amount of material from all of our curatorial depart departments that kind of funnels through us to the DRMC. Um, we have one pipeline at the moment, and so it's just untenable to process about 500 terabytes worth of information into our system. And so with these sort of challenges in mind, and I'll pass it to Caroline, who's gonna kind of talk about how we're gonna solve them, hopefully. <laughs> <clears throat> Hello. Um, yeah, so as Peter illustrated, um, it's clear that MoMA has a problem and that we're struggling with the difficulty of managing a massive quantity of DPX files that are coming into the collection. Um, like he said, uh, we are also facing the challenges of capturing the key decision-making processes of film preservation projects undertaken by MoMA's film department um, within the files themselves or within the bags themselves. Um, and so now I'll talk about the ongoing research that we're developing at MoMA and present, to, present it to you with hopes that we, in hopes of getting feedback. Um, the key decisions that we would want to capture within um, those uh, DBX files would include metadata about the persons or persons involved in a particular preservation project, ownership statement, creation date, fixity, et cetera. Um, this research that we are developing, um, this research, research and developing our capacity for embedding metadata into our file, film preservation file deliverables would in turn help us bridge a knowledge gap between vendors and film, the film department and across the conservation department. So we're working across departments within the museum. Um, and an additional impetus for diving head out into this research was that we wanted to develop a workflow and a methodology for condition assessing and documenting DPX sequences coming out of our film preservation projects. So um, our traditional ingest workflow was designed around single file intake. And so to handle the massive quantity of files coming in, uh, a, strate a strategy to disk image um, hard drives containing multiple DPX projects was devised. And after some trials and errors, we are now looking to move away from that workflow and develop a new, a new workflow that functions within our system and within the different uh, key parts of our system. Um, so in the process, we became aware that there was a lack of consensus uh, in clear allusion of the title or the name of the co this conference amongst the field in terms of handling and, and or preservation of DPX materials. Um, it was also a concern that the, the unknowns of DPX sustain, su as a sustainable file format, um, that even though it's widely used, and it's perhaps not as so descriptive as other formats. And this was another blind spot within our, our own knowledge of the, file, of the file format. Also, and so since a single film preservation project is likely to produce a variety of deliverables in multiple file types with diverse classifications asso associated to them, a crucial aspect was considering our collection size uh, and determining what to keep and why. Um, so we found ourselves asking, should we keep the raw and color corrected scans for future use? What can we do without? And how can we trim our storage usage? And so before tackling our hopes and dreams, uh, we needed to delve into the big wide open of the DPX file format. Um, we wanted to know how it was supposed to be uh, rendered, how, it's, how we can play it back. Um, what characterization um, methods exist, um, with which, which metadata extraction tools are out there and our peers are using. Um, and so, as we know, uh, DPX, um, DPX is a SIMT standard for its uh, pixel-based raster file format intended for very high quality moving image content with um, with attributes defi defining a binary file header. So this can be tens of thousands of files in a directory. And so it's, uh, it can become very unruly and tough to manage. These are very large uh, size files um, because each D D DPX file represents a single image or frame in a sequence uh, of a motion picture. Um, so we, 
like I said, we wanted to reestablish and refine our internal procedures and work workflows within and across uh, departments and capture the key decision-making processes within the film department, but also conservation and working with vendors. Um, so we devised a plan. Um, so me and my lovely fellow, fellow colleague, Flaminia Fortunato, and I compiled a list uh, of metadata readers and analys analysis tools um, that we wanted to play with and experiment with, and this included Media Info, SIF2, Image Magic, DPX Analytics, amongst others. And we took the output of those uh, metadata extraction tools and dumped them into yet another spreadsheet and uh, use that spreadsheet for comparison. Uh, we use a small sample of 2K resolution 10-bit files coming in from 8 millimeter, 8 millimeter and 16 millimeter black and white film sources. Um, and we then looked at how the tools were expressing metadata values, and in some instances, how terminology or the order of the fields would change from one tool to the other. Um, so we found out that Media Info Trace report was satisfactory uh, due to some sponsored development, which we allowed uh, Media Info to read, uh, parse, and output DPX metadata into an XML file. Um, and this is uh, lucky for us because in our Archimatica workflow, this XML file uh, would be ported into the MEX XML file that would live with the AIP. Um, and so from our reading and research, we found out that the file header field, which records the color space of the DPX file, uh, is frequently incorrect, which can mean that systems which rely on this information for display or transcoding may have problems. So this uh, led us into researching playback software for DPX for condition assessment procedures. So we were looking at FF Play, Resolve, or DaVinci Resolve, and Premiere, and lossless transcoding options that are out there um, for efficient storage and preservation. So this included MXF uh, in OP1A, MXF in JPEG 2000, and FFB1 in Matroska. Um, as well as examining uh, options such as zipping and tearing directories. So in this um, testing phase, we took note of the time it took to process uh, files in their transcoding and transformation, and also to process them within our Acafmatica pipeline. And we additionally ran tests to, to MUX, or DPX, file, DPX and WAV files, using raw cooked. Um, so we took the newly created OP1A, JPEG 2000, and Matroska files and transcoded them back into DPX and verified their checksums as a control method and for corroborating if any file corruption had occurred. Um, so looking at this, we arrived at some very preliminary results. Uh, and I'm here, I'm providing some very preliminary stat statistics. We're still in the process of par parsing our results and we'll be happy to share them with anybody who's interested in them in the future. So for example, a 2K resolution DPX directory composed of 14,000 files amount amounting to 103 gigabytes trans would transfer into a 60, 60 something uh, gigabyte NKV using raw cooked. And so same 2K resolution DPX direct directory composed of 49,000 files amounting to 600 gigabytes will transform into a 200 uh, gigabyte MK Matroska using raw cooked. Um, so a, a third of shrink. Um, and using SIP or SIPing uh, a directory, a 2K resolution DPX directory uh, of 70,000 files would shrink into would shrink from 145 gigabytes to 50, 50 gigabytes. Um, so we ran these test files through one of our Archimatica testing pipelines and saw that it took roughly about five hours to process a DPX sequence transcoded to FFV1 wrapped in Matroska. So that's a very significant consider considering what Peter said that it would take four hours before. Um, and we. Uh, but we also have to look into um, research into uh, AI, store AIP failures that we were getting within the Archimatica Ar 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 um, system. So this is to say that we still have a lot of work to do, and we welcome feedback. 
Um, so our next steps are doing more, 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 more testing, including uh, escrow retrieval from our storage provider, our Archivum, more analysis of our research and the results of our research, developing methodologies and procedures for condition assessment of DPX files within a mu museum context, attending this conference and seeping the knowledge of this room, and starting a robust dialogue with colleagues and peers, including a convening, a convening of a peer forum in November um, to see and discuss what others in the field are doing in a safe space. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So are there any questions? Oh, there's an online question. I'm going to get recorded. Um, did they come across AXF archival exchange format? We did not test with that, but do we have that in there? Yeah, we haven't tested with it. We do know about it, um, but we just focused on this data set mm -hmm. and the initial testing. So you need front porch to test with AXF. Mm -hmm. Oh, you need front porch. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mike, man. Yeah, dude, Mike. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my gosh. Um, so it's, we went through quite a lot of exploring this AXF during our developing our system. This is not a question. I shouldn't be allowed. Um, um, and, and as far as we can tell, I, I tried hard to find a non-front porch system that implemented AXF, yeah. and I could not find one. Oh, that's super good to know. Okay. So I could be wrong, and please correct me. I'd love to find out. I ask Front Porch for a reference implementation or any other implementation other than theirs. They just refer to the specification paper, and that's it. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that answers it. Um, I have a question about your DPX files. I'm just curious, because uh, as an FFmpeg developer, we often receive such files. Do your files contain an infrared channel that shows damages on the original film uh, that was scanned? So I don't know. Um, so we, this is initial testing, and um, a lot of this work is being carried out by the film department by a variety of vendors. Um, so that's actually kind of our next step is to kind of dig deeper into what each of these vendors is providing to us. So we've just been doing a sample set at the moment. But um, that's a super good question and something we hope to dig into further. So I would like everybody who has such files uh, to forward them because apparently there is a it is not clearly specified how this channel uh, should be interpreted. And I think Jerome and I in the past had a, a small discussion about it. So in, if anybody has such files, please forward them. Thank you. Hi, hola. Um, yeah, I have a question just out of curiosity. You mentioned that the source materials um, you you take the DPX files are eight millimeter and sixteen millimeter, mm -hmm. mm, but I guess you also scan thirty five millimeter, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which resolution and bit depth do you use? Four thirty five is four K sixteen. Yeah, yeah, it varies yeah. project to project, but it's you know generally you know two K sixteen and eight and four K for thirty five. But I mean, in the case of the Burt Williams, you saw it was two K. Um, so it really depends on what the project is. Okay, and just uh, I have those samples so that uh, you were referring about the infrared, so I can send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't use 35 millimeters as a sample because of time, essentially. Yeah. Hi, um, I saw there that um, in your test you were rewrapping to um, FFE1 on Matroska and JPEG 2000 MXF, but I also saw MXF OP1A up there as well. Mm -hmm. So can you just tell me, was that... Um, what tool did you use? Was that just a rewrapping of the DPX to yeah. um, MXF? Yes, using Resolve. Mm -hmm. Yes, 